Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Roy Gutman, the president of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. And on behalf of the Board of Trustees, I welcome everyone. Eldridge Colby served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense from 2017 to 2018. In that role, he was the lead official in the de development and rollout of the 2018 National Defense Strategy. Uh, it's called the NDS, or nicknamed the NDS. Uh, and it, it, in this case, it shifted the Pentagon's focus to the challenges that China and Russia pose uh, for U.S. interests. He also served as the primary Pentagon representative in the development of the president's 2017 national security strategy. <clears throat> From 2014 to 2017, he was a senior fellow at the Center for the New American Security. Before that, he was principal analyst for global strategic affairs at the Center of, for Naval uh, Analyses. He was co-founder and is principal, the principal of the Marathon Institute, or sorry, Marathon Initiative, <clears throat> which focuses on strategies for the era of great power competition. He's thought a lot about the priorities in this complex world we live in, and he's drawn conclusions. <clears throat> One is that America has to choose between aiding Ukraine and deterring a Chinese invasion of, of Taiwan. Uh, he calls for sending weapons from the U.S. stockpile to Taiwan first and then to Ukraine. Uh, the new House Speaker, Mike Johnson, voted consistently against aid to Ukraine but as a House member. But as he said in an interview just after his selection as Speaker, we cannot allow Vladimir Putin to win in Ukraine because it would encourage and empower China uh, to perhaps make a move on Taiwan. Uh, but but that, that said, uh, the new Speaker put a higher priority, priority on aid to Israel than to Ukraine in his very first piece of le major legislation. So the war in <clears throat> the war between Israel and Hamas has thus uh, made the debate even more complex than when we sent out the invitation to our members. Uh, Mr. Colby has uh, thoughtfully offered to broaden his talk tonight to include all three, the Middle East, Ukraine, and Taiwan, and how we should prioritize them. It doesn't sound easy, but Bridge, t tell us how you would do it. Well, thank you, Roy, uh, for the kind invitation. Thank you also to Robbie. It's great to be back with the Baltimore Council. I'm just sorry it's not in person. <clears throat> and you can get, if you go to Bob Zellick's talk, you'll get a very different perspective. So, uh, you know, kudos for having a, <clears throat> excuse me, a diversity of, of views. I know we only have about an hour and a Zoom is, uh, uh, you know, an hour is about all people can, can stomach. So I'll try to be, <clears throat> excuse me, efficient. <clears throat> I mean, basically, my point of view is that we are no longer in the era of unipolarity, which means that uh, the United States is not uh, any longer by far the most dominant actor in the international system. Uh, in fact, um, while the United States has held a relatively stable share of global power, uh, the share that held by our allies has declined precipitously. In fact, just over the last 10 years, Europe has gone from being about 91% of American GDP uh, to about 65% currently. So power is diffusing. In that world, we need to, uh, you know, think more, think more clearly and more strategically about where we put our main efforts and what we're really focused on. And in that light, you know, if we're if we're thinking as as I do that we should have a, a small R Republican foreign policy focused on the American people's security, prosperity, and liberty. The most the most significant threat to that is, uh, by far uh, is a uh, other than a, a direct nuclear attack, which we can get into, uh, unlikely for uh, unless ground in, in a uh, you know, major war that's otherwise happening. Uh, by far the most significant threat to that is a, uh, a foreign power uh, agglomerating so much control over uh, a portion of the global GDP that they could use it to un directly uh, coerce us and thereby undermine our, our economic prosperity and security and ultimately our liberties. I mean, this is in a sense exactly the same logic that George Kennan applied in 1947 at the National Defense University speech or Nicholas Spikeman during the during the Second World War, in his uh, you know seminal book, and you know he goes back in a sense to to balance of power thinking uh, in Great Britain and their traditional strategy towards the continent, et cetera. So it has very very deep roots. If you look at the world in that way, uh, China is by far the strongest power in the world, uh, other than the United States itself. It's ten times the GDP of Russia. It's probably something like thirty three times or fifty times the GDP of Iran or North Korea. And Asia is by far the world's most important market area. I mean, I, it's just a fact that Europe is not the center of the world anymore. We act like it is. Our, our minds or our, our pocketbooks are oriented towards Asia, but our minds, particularly in the foreign policy establishment, are still oriented on Europe. Not to say that Europe's not important, but as I just said, 
Uh, the European economies are in significant, I would say, almost precipitous decline. According to the EU itself, Europe's going to go from about 20 to 25 percent of global GDP today to about 10 percent uh, of 20 years from now. Where is it going? Primarily to Asia. There are other parts, you know, Europe, the Middle East, Latin America, but primarily to Asia. So Asia is going to be upwards of 50 percent of global GDP in the future. So if China, by deduction, if China could dominate Asia, there's no other power that could pretend to do so. Uh, in Asia, then that would be by far the most significant challenge to our uh, security and our, our our liberties. And so by deduction, the most important thing is preventing them from doing so. How would they do so? In theory, they could do so peacefully in three economic means. They're not succeeding. They've actually tried that uh, method, I would say, over the last decade or two decades through things like Belt and Road and et cetera. But you know, long story short, that's actually backfired. China is increasingly unpopular not only in Asia, but beyond. If you look at surveys around Asia from Pew and so forth, they're really not going to be able to use econo economic leverage to achieve their goals of what I think of as a secure geoeconomic sphere. Uh, and you know that's a very attractive outcome. It's very it's standard for rising great powers to to try to establish you know a secure geoeconomic sphere. You can call it different things. The, the British call it an empire. The Japanese would have called it a Greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. The Germans in World War I would have called it a customs union. But basically an area where they have a dominant uh, footprint in terms of markets, commercial relationships, scale, et cetera, natural resources. Um, so that's what they're that's what they're going after. I don't think they're going to get to it peacefully. They can't even convince the Taiwanese to come over peacefully. So they could give up at that point or they can use military force. Are they using military force? Could they use military force? Absolutely. If you look historically, the way countries have pursued this kind of goal and, and sort of ratcheting up their geopolitical influence is through uh, the use of military uh, coercion. People say war doesn't pay. That's not true. Ask the Mexicans uh, what happened to them with us. Uh, ask, um, you know, uh, Denmark, Austria and France. They were the object of uh, Berlin's use of conflict to achieve geopolitical goals. So so you can achieve not all wars pay. Some can, be, you know, World War One was pretty destructive for everybody involved, but they can be successful. Another one would be the Six Day War in the case of Israel. Dramatic change in the geopolitical uh, arrangements. Um, so in theory, they could use that to basically what I would say is break apart uh, this anti-hegemonic coalition that's forming in Asia. You can see it through things like AUKUS, the Quad, et cetera. There are multiple mechanisms. But basically, traditional balancing behavior to check China's overweening ambitions. This is happening. China could la essentially use its military instrument to break that apart and cow the regional countries into accommodating its rise because you know, while living under China's thumb might be unattractive, being made an example of and being destroyed is is even less attractive. So countries would have an incentive. OK, that's that's theoretical and speculative at this point. Are they doing that? Yes, they absolutely are building a military to do that. That's the thing. And in fact, even more than that, they're building a military. I mean, I was talking to a Japanese diplomat earlier today who was saying, well, you know, are they really willing to whisk, risk a war with the United States centered on Taiwan? I can go into the particular issue of Taiwan and people want to, but actually, well, what would you do in that case? First, you'd build a military fort. They're doing that. Secondly, you would exercise your military to remedy deficiencies. People commonly point out that the PLA is not yet confident in its ability to take on the United States. Probably true, but they are they are acting to try to fix those problems. Third, you would build a military that assumed that you had succeeded in subsuming Taiwan at some point. That's what they're doing. They're building a basing architecture in distant, for instance, naval power productions that Captain Harris is an ex would be an expert on, aircraft carriers, these kinds of things that assume that they've broken out of what's called the first island chain. Secondly, you do not take on the Americans without a stronger nuclear force. Well, they're in nuclear breakout. They increased their nuclear forces by a factor of 25 percent last year alone, at least according to the reported figures. You would uh, sanction proof your economy. That's what they're doing. You would try to build additional leverage on the United States and our allies in the event of a conflict, that's what they're doing. You would deepen your relationships with other countries that are hostile to the United States that you could rely on in the event of a conflict with the United States, Russia, Iran, North Korea, et cetera. And you would politically prepare your population and the broader political environment uh, for the potential for conflict. Well, Xi Jinping himself is telling the Chinese people to be ready for choppy waters and extreme circumstances and has conditioned the, the world to um, you know the the potential election of of of, uh, of Lot William Lai in Taiwan and other things 
to basically condition the situation. So I think there's a very real prospect of a conflict. The Chinese are actively preparing for it. I don't make any predictions. I will say that even Tony Blinken, nobody's idea of a super hawk, has reported that the Xi Jinping has given instructions to the PLA to be ready to attack Taiwan successfully by 2027. And it stands to reason the Chinese are not going to give us, you know, perfect warning of exactly when they move, because that would be stupid, especially if you're using what they're, you know, one of the lessons from the Ukraine war, which is to act decisively. You don't mess around. You don't try half measures. You do it right or you go home. Um, so and that, that's how I look at the context of everything else that's happening in the world. And nothing else is as important as that. OK, the Russians uh, uh, initiated an abominable and evil invasion of Ukraine. Correct. However, the Russians are one tenth the the strength of the Chinese by economic measures. Europe, meantime, is uh, uh, is much stronger relative to Russia than any of our Asian allies. China is about 50 percent of the GDP of Asia. So China is like this massive behemoth next to its neighbors. You need a deep American presence there to have a plausible hope of balancing China. Meantime, in Europe, there are several European economies that are larger than, than Russia. I mean, it's simply absurd. And I say this to them repeatedly to their face and in media. It is absurd for the Germans to say that they cannot take up a bigger portion of this burden. They just refuse to do so. They lack the will. And this was not always the case. This is not a post-war thing. This is a post-Cold War thing. The Germans in 1988 had 15 divisions when their own necks were on the line. So it's simply a matter of will. The Poles, for instance, deserve a lot of credit for, um, for leading the way. More European countries should do that. Fundamentally, the Russians are bogged down in eastern Ukraine. I don't know. I'm actually less sanguine than many. I think the Russians remain a threat. I think they are rebuilding their uh, military. They are transforming their, their economy into a, a wartime economy that will be able to produce more weapons. They're getting help from the North Koreans and the Iranians, et cetera. So I don't discount them. I'm not saying they're a joke. But fundamentally, we are talking about something that's happening at the eastern extremity of our theoretical interests in Europe. And if our interest is an anti-hegemonic interest in Europe at the end of the day, it's not Europe whole and free in my view, that's a Kantian dream. What we're really interested in is that no other power dominate Europe. We're way, way beyond what we need to be able to do to, to achieve that. So I'm against Ukraine and NATO. I think that we should not get involved directly in the war. I think that we should provide the Ukrainians with capabilities that are not needed in uh in in the pacific you know concretely for for denial defense uh of of taiwan which is the priority in the middle east i also don't think we should get directly involved in the middle east the last thing we need is a significant middle eastern war specifically one especially one that would be a large scale effort against iran that would clearly compromise our ability to uphold our interests in the pacific and i should say that we are making trade offs the notion <clears throat> One of the frustrating things about the last two years is I've been saying for a long time, there are trade-offs, obviously money, political will, and weapons, but also the sort of um, subcomponents, or the if you think of the, the defense industrial base as like a boa constrictor, there's a big rat caught in there. There's a, The digestion process is very slow. So you have a lot of politicians and pundits saying the defense industrial base has been fixed. Unfortunately, that's the very, very far from the truth. I mean, it's, for instance, the javelins and stingers uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, sort of handheld or kind of man operated air portable air defense system, those are going to take years and years to replace. So even if we were acting as we should be, in my view, is we should be a national mobilization of our defense industrial base, which is not what we're doing at all. Even if we were doing that, it would take years and years to fix the problem. We're not doing that. At best, it's going to take us years and years. I mean, if you look at the submarine uh, industrial base, for instance, the most important, probably the single most important weapon in our inventory vis-a-vis -vis China, we're way behind. The uh, Congress, uh, it's not a money issue. They're saying, yeah, you can have enough money to produce two submarines a year. The reality is we can only produce 1.2 to 1.3. So they're major trade-offs. Don't, we don't want to get in, involved in the Middle East war. I think we should support our very close ally, Israel. We have a special relationship with the Israelis uh, that goes back many, many years. They are being attacked deep in their, you know, their, their backs are against the wall. The thing about the Israelis is they're not asking us to intervene, uh, to come in on their behalf. What they're asking for is the political backing, to some extent the financial backing, as well as the uh, some kind of weapon systems, uh, to be able to prosecute what I think is a just uh, response to the abomination, the, the, the really barbaric attacks by Hamas going into Gaza and the staying power to stay with them to go in there and dismantle Hamas's military infrastructure, what precisely they're gonna, their, their strategic objective is. Um, but we should, you know, frankly, from my point of view, 
you know, I see the carriers there. I see the SSGN apparently, you know, Blinken is all over the place, partially because our forces are getting fired at in Iraq and Syria. And I'm wondering to myself, what is it that those forces are really doing? I mean, in effect, they appear to be operating as a kind of hostage to the Iranians that are causing us to restrain our ally. And part of the importance of dealing with the Israelis here is that we want more allies like Israel or like India that are not effectively protectorates, but that are basically willing and able to take a much more vigorous role in their own self-defense. I mean, in the case of Israel, where they don't even, or India, where they don't even want us to be involved. That's great. That's the kind of thing we want. So we want to help uh, as much as possible. Even in that case, though, our, our priority must remain uh, Asia. And I think with, with the supplemental, I mean, it makes sense to me that you would break them apart. I do think you would want to have more attention to the China fight. You know, this is not something that there's merely Republicans or general officers saying. Frank Kendall, the Secretary of the Air Force, who was on this point from way before it was fashionable 10 years ago. Dave Ockmanek of the Rand Corporation. I think Bob Work is also of this view, uh, former Deputy Secretary of Defense, that we are not where we need to be. And I just, I don't really, you know, the president gave an Oval Office address the other day. It's the first time he'd done so. And he didn't even mention China. I mean, what does that tell you? So I'm very, very, very worried because that looks to me like an ideal situation for China to, to think about making a move. Because if China's going to make a move, remember, war can pay if you're successful. I mean, if the Chinese defeat us in the Western Pacific, that is not just about the disposition of Taiwan. That is a tectonic shift in the Asian geopolitical landscape where countries start to accommodate Beijing and shift away from us. And that has huge reverberations in the economic spaces, which the stakes is what this is really about. If you think countries like South Korea and the Philippines and ASEAN are going to stay like they've been doing, I think you got another thing coming. They're going to start to accommodate China. And that's going to be a huge amount. And of course, the Europeans and the Middle Easterners and the Latins are all going to follow suit because that's where the money's going to be. And the Chinese are going to be the gatekeepers. So if China can succeed, that's a huge gain for them. The question for Beijing is, are they going to be successful? And my book is called The Strategy of Denial. This is what I pushed in the Pentagon. The key thing for deterrence is to persuade them that we will plausibly be able to frustrate their goals. Not that we're going to impose costs. Sanctions don't really work. It's not credible that we would do first large scale first nuclear use. It's got to be about denial, frustration of their goals. So if you're China and you've suddenly and you've gotten into a situation where the Americans are, are engaged in a, according to the Ukrainian chief of defense, a stalemated war in in Europe. By the way, stalemated possibly could be a relatively better outcome. There are worse potential outcomes if the if the Russians appear to be advantaged over time, which Putin appears to think is the case. And he's evil, but he's not crazy. So that's very worrisome. And now the Americans are putting 20,000 or so forces, huge amount of political capital and attention in the Middle East. The president gives a speech, doesn't even mention China. He's sending his diplomats, Janet Yellen, et cetera, et cetera, to essentially communicate to China that we the last thing we want is is to a, a further crisis or conflict in the Pacific. I mean, if you're China, that's almost a perfect opportunity. So, I mean, I'm very concerned. I think the big question is, would they be would they be successful? And that's where we've, you know, we've really got to keep our eye on the ball or put our eye on the ball because we've taken our eye off the ball. We have been distracted. I don't think there's any question at this point. Um, and, you know, Xi Jinping hasn't changed. The leopard hasn't changed his spots at all. They continue to do all the things that have made us worried. In fact, it's worse than ever, according to the Pentagon military, China military power port. So that's the reason. Um, unfortunately, at this point, I think we're in a world of bad choices, of very bad choices. So anybody who's telling you there's an easy way out should be dismissed, in my view. And I think a lot of our leaders, and frankly, on both sides of the political aisle, are, are playing that tune. You know, that's a, that's a Pied Piper kind of tune. Anyone who's saying there's an easy way out of this is not credible. My view is that we should take risk in the, in the secondary and tertiary theater and focus on getting the big thing right. Other people have a different view. A friend of mine, Aaron McLean, who used to work for Tom Cotton, his view is we should, you know, take more risk maybe in the, I think if I'm putting words in his mouth, he, we should focus more on trying to wrap things up in the Middle East and Europe and maybe take some more risk in the Pacific. It's a, it's a reasonable position. I disagree with it, but at least it's reckoning with the severity and gravity of the situation and the reality of scarcity. I think our, as a country, we need to have that level of maturity and that's not where we are. Saying that we're America and we can do anything ain't gonna cut it because we're really, that's really not where we are. I mean, China has 200 times 
the shipbuilding capacity of the United States. And that's not me saying that. That's Rear Admiral Bill Studeman. I think it's Bill. Anyway, the, the son, who is the director of naval, naval intelligence. That's a that's an ONI statement. They are, they're having a nuclear, they're, they're doing things that we are not even, I mean, on the hypersonics front, they have done things that we didn't even know were possible. So we're not dealing with some ramshackle third rate military like Iraq or something like that. And I say that with respect to those who serve because you never know. And we didn't know at the time, but this is a totally different order of magnitude. So it demands our focus. Time is very short. Unfortunately, I've been saying this for five plus years and we sort of say it at one level of our head, but we don't actually follow through on it. Um, so we're in, we're in, we're in a grim, grim situation. Thanks very much, Bridge. Um, it was a very uh, stirring call to, uh, to, to, to pay attention uh, uh, to, to, to the crisis that is existing in many, many parts of the world right now. Um, before I should remind our uh, viewers that uh, Please, if you have questions, put them in the Q and A, uh, and we will get. And Robbie Harris will get to them. Maybe I'll ask one question in the meantime. <clears throat> um, we had a speaker. Our last speaker just a month ago was the ambassador of Poland, <clears throat> and um, he was discussing uh, the relationship with Germany. Uh, Poland obviously is a power that's uh, rising in Europe and, and, and is taking security very, very seriously <clears throat> and plans to be a participant in European security. Um, but uh, he was scathing about uh, Germany. And of course, the Polish government has been uh, because they were very uh, late to the uh, to, to, to the volunteer line uh, to help Ukraine. They've been slow to send weapons. Um and then you've got the history of Germany uh, going back to 2014 when Angela Merkel was the prime minister. Uh, they didn't really uh, take a leadership role at that point. And in fact, instead, they they signed up for the uh, the uh, pipeline, the Nord Stream pipe, pipeline. So is Germany really a candidate <clears throat> to uh, to lead European security? And in fact, if you think about European history, is that is that a practical way to go? And if And if it isn't Germany, who would it be? Well, thanks. And and uh, the the Polish ambassador is a is a good friend. He's a he's a really smart guy, and I have a, lot, a great deal of sympathy for the Polish um, position. Even though I don't always agree with them, I I think they have a very serious uh, strategic mindset, um, which is uh, in desperately short supply in Europe. Look, I don't think there's really I don't see an alternative to Germany. I mean, Germany is by far the largest European economy, um, and it's at least relatively proximate to the area of focus. So the primary um, the, the primary scenario that we're thinking about would be a Russian attack into the Baltics, maybe over time into, into, into uh, Finland and or Poland. Now, Poland's relieving a lot of this problem by its own exertions. So it's showing what's possible by its significant increase in defense spending. Um, is, is Germany capable of playing a more leading role in European security? And I mean, when, you say, when we say leading, I mean, if you looked at a laydown of NATO forces along the inner German border in 1985, Half of them were West German or something like that. I mean, the West Germans had a huge military. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, tanks, tactical aviation, artillery, helicopters, the whole nine yards, right? So Germany can do it. <laughs> the question is, do they want to do it? And so um, I, you know, I have I have become convinced that Germany, in effect, I'm not sure they think about it this way, pursues a ruthlessly self-interested policy. So when their necks were on the line, they rearmed. I mean, Bear in mind that was the, the same people who had served in the Wehrmacht were in the in the Bundeswehr in the 1950s and 60s. So the notion that the Germans, you know, had this post-war pacification is is a falsehood, and I think it's I think I actually find it very distasteful when I see Germans play this point up because they know it's not true. And if you go back and you look at Adenauer or Franz Josef Strauss or Helmut Kohl, in fairness, they had a real commitment to the Western defense, to collective defense. Germany's militarization was not in service. It was not a unitary or unilateral thing. It was within the context of NATO. So we just reboot that model. You know, you don't have to have German running the show. You could have an American, you could have a Brit, you could have a Pole, if people feel more comfortable that way. I believe there was a German, I think the German was the commander uh, of a fairly senior allied command during, during the Cold War. So it's not like unprecedented. Um, why isn't Germany doing it? Well, I think the most compelling reason was expressed in a Wall Street Journal article that sourced to the chief of staff, to Olaf Scholz, who said, we don't feel threatened anymore. 
the Zeitenwende speech was given when there were real fears that the Russians would roll through Ukraine and into like Poland and basically be within spitting distance, if you will, of Germany. So they lack the fear. Okay, that's a rational, realist interest, not very admirable, but that's their position. My view is Europe's Europe's choices, the United States does not have the military capacity and won't in the foreseeable future, if ever, have the military capacity to be ready for a major war with, with China and a major war in Europe. And between the two, we need to prioritize China, such that even if Russia attacks Europe, we, in my view, we would need to withhold forces that would be relevant to European fight to be deter a China, a China attack. Because if we use those forces in Europe and expended them or they were lost, it would open us up a huge vulnerability to Chinese attack and the Chinese would be crazy not to exploit it. So I don't think we can do that. So the message is there will be European vulnerability. The question is, will it be filled? So I'm not saying the US pulls out of NATO, but we have a more focused role. So will the Europeans step up? I think the answer, I hopefully yes. If they don't, it will be the Europeans who will bear the costs. So what I'm trying to do in a lot of my messaging to the Europeans is make it clear this is this is gonna happen. So the better off you can prepare in time. And then I think we should, uh, uh, one thing I really don't get about the Biden administration is they're very lenient on German, on the Germans. I think we should be much tougher on Berlin, in a, not in an emotional way, but to say, look, you're, how is it that they have not, that 10 years ago, they committed to spend 2% as part of the Wales summit and 2% should now be a floor. Why are we like allowing them to get by and, and being so understanding? We're all paying three plus percent of our income. And they say, oh, I don't feel threatened. Well, I mean, do people in Baltimore feel threatened? I mean, they presumably feel less threatened than the Germans do. So I don't think I don't think we should take these excuses. And I think we should orient a Europe, Europe policy and really focus it on this issue. Because German, I mean, this administration is much more concerned with German alignment on de-risking. I don't think the de-risking stuff is going to make a big difference in a conflict in the Pacific because economic sanctions don't even work against Russia. They're definitely not going to work against China. That's the best we can do. I mean, it's not like there's nothing. There's Poland is doing a lot and the Russian military has been degraded. But I think the moral thing, I mean, I think if Germans are going to live up to their historic responsibility, the least they can do is help the countries that they pillaged during the Second World War to be defended and then let be dominated by Soviet communism for 40 years, the least they could do would be to spend a little bit more money. This is not, they don't have to build 15 divisions. If there were three or four, you know, plus you could cobble together a Dutch Belgian one. This is not the Red Army we're dealing with. This is a tractable problem. I'm going to um, read to you three questions from our, from our virtual uh, audience. Um, the first one is from uh, Mark Solomon, who's a retired Army officer, uh, the question is, what one or two U.S. capabilities could be decisive in a South China Sea conflict? What one or two U.S. capabilities could be decisive in a South China Sea conflict? That's question number one. Uh, Professor Bob Friedman, one of our trustees, asked this question. Do you think America's allies in the Pacific can help U.S. contain China. Uh, you, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna enjoy answering that one, the bridge. And um, here, here's a, here's another one. Um, what is it, this? Is from Stuart Stammen. What is speed of the U.S. buildup of allies in Asia, Japan, South Korea, Philippines, etc.? How fast are we moving to build up their capabilities? Bridge over to you. Great. Well, uh, to the first question, thanks, Robbie. The, the first question, there, there are no magic bullets. Um, essentially, what we see in um, the Ukraine and, I mean, others obviously are, are more expert on, on you know, the, the nature of war in the modern environment than I am. But, I mean, I think at a macro level, it's pretty clear there are no magic bullets. I mean, I think someone like Steve Biddle has been, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot. I mean, I think a lot of what he's been saying has been vindicated in the sense that you look at the at the Ukraine front, and in in a, in a lot of ways, it probably would not have been, would not be completely surprising to somebody fighting on the on the Western front at the end of World War One, in the sense that, yeah, there's air and stuff. I mean, I, I make the point to exaggerate a little bit, but in the sense that technology tends to kind of net out 
Um, and there's, you know, if you pull out a silver bullet, like the Russians are firing hypersonic missiles, well, there's an air defense and there's hardening and there's dispersal, et cetera. So, I mean, um, that said, I think the most important things are the submarine fleet and having them be, uh, having it be well-equipped and postured in the, in the right way. Uh, you know, the air, uh, the air leg of our, um, of our military that can be armed with effective anti-ship munitions of various kinds. Um, those are probably the most important things. The problem is that that the industrial constraints on across the board, I mean, particularly on submarine construction, but also aircraft uh, construction and munitions production are all very significant. So I think, you know, I mean, look, if we could get to a point in the future where we have you know, the first island chain is essentially bristling with missiles, uh, you know, anti-ship, um, you know, potentially, you know, land attack, uh, air defense, mines, you know, various other kind, you know, unmanned systems that just make it impossible to get across that body, that body of water. That's, that's where we want to be. So we kind of know what we need to do. It's not, it's not, I mean, there are, there are serious military operational challenges, but it's more about how do we get there and how do we develop the political resolve to get us there fast enough. So that's that's what I'd say. I also would stress that the the role of the Taiwanese in their own self-defense should not be underestimated and not from a purely kind of fairness or, you know, sort of morale point of view, but just to the fact that, you know, people often say, well, Taiwan wouldn't be a land fight. And that's not true because the Chinese are going to try to get ashore on mass. And I think we have to assume they are, but forces fighting from land are going to play an incredibly important part. Obviously trying to reach out and sink or degrade the invasion flotilla, air, air, uh, you know, air airplanes and and helicopters coming across, but also the reality is there's probably going to be large numbers of Chinese who land on the island, and there's going to be a t a very bitter fight there. And if the Taiwanese can't hold on, that's going to be a real problem. You know, they could collapse like a cheap suit. So that's that's another critical point. Um, I don't love the term containment uh, for a variety of reasons. I would call it more of a balance of power. Our um, the role of our Asian allies is is, is essential. Uh, Asia and I use allies, allies and partners as well. Countries like India, Vietnam, etc. Um, in fact, that's a lot of why it's so important to defend Taiwan. You know, simply speaking, the United States alone cannot take on China in its own front yard, ten thousand miles from the west coast, or what, or whatever it is, six thousand, seven thousand miles. Um, so we need, you know, we need countries in the region to to come along. Fortunately, their interests are aligned. The, the, the perimeter countries facing China have a natural incentive to want to stand up to China and to want to affiliate with the United States, which I call the cornerstone balancer in this anti-hegemonic coalition. This is actually happening. I mean, if you go down the line, the Chinese have essentially alienated everybody. Japan, increasingly South Korea, Taiwan, the Philippines, Vietnam hedges, but basically is, does not want to be under China's thumb, and then, and then India. The problem is that um, none of these countries matches anywhere close, even India or Japan don't even come close to China. So the role of the United States is very important. And this gets to my point on the third question. So there is a lot going, uh, my critique of the current administration's approach on this, and I think they're trying, you know, they're moving in the right direction in a lot of ways, but is there's much too little focus on the hard power balance, because what's gonna matter here is the military balance and not the optics of, photo ops with, with President Yoon of South Korea and Prime Minister Kushida of Japan and the president at Camp David. I'm not saying those things are necessarily bad, but that photo op ain't gonna do anything unless the Japanese are ready in the event of a, Ch of a Chinese attack to come in and force from point of view of political resolve and from the point of view of actual combat readiness, I mean, and capability. And the Japanese are talking a good game about increasing their defense spending, but they're not going to get to even close to 2% until 2027, which is the year the administration is telling us that Xi Jinping openly is telling the PLA to be ready by. They could move before them. We don't know. I mean, General Minahan, the Air Combat Command uh, or Air Mobility Commander, was was uh, lambasted, I believe, earlier this year for saying 2025. But that's not, it's not an impossibility. Um, and nobody really knows. So <clears throat> I think where we are with the Asian allies is we're in the right direction, but we are moving, you know, the way I would say is China's moving like this and we're moving like that. And that's that's a big gap. And that's why we need to prioritize the region uh, because we're not we're not where we need to be in the hard power balance. Bridge, thank you so much. Uh, two more two more questions, and, and there are others as well. 
Um, here is one from Donna Price. Uh, Ms. Price asked, if push comes to shove reach China, Taiwan, U.S., what type of press pressure might there be for the U.S. to use tactical nuclear weapons? That's question number one. Yep. The, what pressure <laughs> can you use tact nukes? And then here's one um, from Stephen David. Why would China go to war in Asia when it can meet its economic goals peacefully? You say war pays. Well, ask Japan and Germany if, w if World War II paid for them. Xi's hold on power and China's economy cannot afford a defeat in war, cannot afford a defeat in war or even a prolonged stalemate. It's worth worrying about Taiwan, but your views of China are footing more generally in Asia, not persuasive. Over to you, Rich. I didn't quite get the last part, but um, well, let me talk about the stakes first. Um, I mean, if you if you if you ask Chinese, uh, they don't believe that. Um, in fact, I had the opportunity to ask the other day. Uh, they don't believe that they will achieve um, their economic goals uh, under the current situation. They believe that the United States under the Biden administration is trying to contain and suppress them. That's their official line when they rejected Lloyd Austin's request to meet with uh, Li Shengfu at Shangri-La, they said one of the accusations was the United States is trying to contain and suppress them and essentially suppress their economic development. I was briefing a number of ambassadors a few months ago, and one of them from a country that has very close links with China said, how do you deal with the fact that all Chinese think that you're trying to hold back their development? You will never accept that you won't be number one. And of course, under a liberal democratic administration, we're putting on semiconductor sanctions and all this kind of stuff. So the Chinese clearly are thinking that they're never going to um, it's never going to get better. So, um, I mean, Xi Jinping himself has apparently said that the United States is trying to strangle China. Um, and I mean, the Chinese are not completely off base in the sense that even though Sullivan and co are talking about de-risking in small yards, uh, high fences, I think the Chinese perceive and with some justification that actually what we're trying to do is hold back their future development and be able to stay dominant for as long as uh, for, for the foreseeable future. So um, so that is that's the reality, I think, um, of, of what they see. And I, I don't think they're completely crazy. I think it's exaggerated, but I don't think they're crazy. And well, yeah, of course. I mean, but when Japan attacked the United States, it was one tenth the economic size of the United States. And you know who had the biggest industrial base in the world? We did, right? Now China is the one with the world's largest industrial base. And I mean, China would struggle in a long war. What do you think would happen in the United States? I mean, we already have very high interest rates. I mean, are we in a position to launch a massive economic war uh, against China? That would be very painful. Uh, infl I mean, if we think inflation is a problem now, that would be extremely formidable. Um, so Again, it gets back to the question of would they be successful? So you can point to Japan and Germany, or you can point to the United States and Mexico or Israel in the Six Day War or Germany in the wars of German unification or Savoy in the wars of Italian unification. You can appoint to Japan's experience of dealing with China and Russia or at the turn of the century. So it really gets back again to the critical predicate, which is, are they going to be defeated or denied or not? That's the critical question. In terms of the question about tactical nuclear weapons, my view is that um, nuclear deterrence in, in the contemporary context is less salient than it was during the Cold War. Um, and this is good, but it's also bad. The good part is that people are kind of less, there's, there's sort of less itchy trigger finger on the nuclear lanyard than there was during the Cold War. Um, so that's good. <clears throat> the downside, is that it makes a large conventional war or a large war that stays at the level of kind of a tactical or limited nuclear use more plausible. I mean, basically in the Cold War, there was a lot of thinking about nuclear stuff, but at the end of the day, the Soviets in particular concluded there was no way to start a major war in the European theater without it escalating to like Armageddon kind of stuff, which they basically said is not worth it, it's a rational decision. But there were 10,000 US nuclear weapons scattered around the European continent. 
there were huge numbers of strategic, even more U.S. strategic weapons. I mean, we had nuclear weapons coming out of our ears in the military. I mean, Robbie, I, I'm sure Robbie served on naval surface vessels that had nuclear weapons on them. After 1991, the U.S. got rid of all of those. So the with the exception of the ballistic missile submarines, the Navy does not operationally put nuclear weapons on any other surface, uh, on any other vessels. And nuclear weapons are much less, they're reserved for much kind of mo much more at the national level, which was not the case during the Cold War. Or, I mean, they're, they're much more limited because we've been uh, reducing their reliance. Unfortunately, if you're China, that means both of us are basically preparing for a large conventional war that could escalate to the use of tactical nuclear weapons in a fairly limited way, but in probably in ways that wouldn't really change the battlefield. And the problem is that we don't have the tactical nuclear force that we had in the 1980s, where we had anti-ship nuclear weapons, we had all kinds of anti-air, ground attack, et cetera. We're not even in a position where we could use tactical nuclear weapons for significant battlefield effect. And if you're interested, I've written about this in various different places. So this is a real deficit. But I think the end of the day, I, I think Americans are not, are not going to go very high up the brinksmanship ladder of nuclear weapons with China solely over a Taiwan context. So basically, if the Chinese win, if they successfully invade or are conquering Taiwan, the U.S., I, I'm skeptical the U.S. would use nuclear weapons first at any scale. And even if we did, it would probably be largely demonstrative because I don't think Americans would see the stakes as sufficient. We would probably just draw the, defen the, the defense perimeter behind Taiwan. Um, and meantime, if we defeated a, a Chinese invasion and then they used nuclear weapons against us first, well, that would sort of get our fighting spirit up more. And we would say we, we can't allow this kind of thing to happen. In these kinds of contexts, it's more common. I Nobody's really run this experiment, thankfully. But if you got into this kind of situation, I tend to think that it would end where it had started with like a ratification of the existing battle lines. I mean, that's probably, you know, that's what we have in Korea. That may be what ends up in Ukraine, whereas like you're not going to be able to use nuclear threats to change things fundamentally. So the key then is to have the conventional denial capability and then have a nuclear, a more effective and tailored nuclear force that can deal with Chinese attempts to escalate its way out of defeat. Bridge, thank you very much. But first, I can neither confirm nor deny my command of nuclear weapons. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Well, here is a question um, or comment from Reed Harrison. He says, got it on the importance of military power in the Pacific. But what about economic power? What can the U.S. and its allies do to weaken China's economy? Bridge, over to you. I, honestly, and this is, I think, the nub, of the, of the nub of my disagreement on the China policy with China. I just, I don't think economic measures do that much. I mean, I am, I'm actually, I mean, in my book, I basically, you know, I go through the, the analysis and my, my assessment is that economic sanctions are of limited utility and even more than economic <laughs> sanctions, measures designed to change another state's calculus by the infliction of pain are not very effective. So embargoes, even bombing. I mean, if you look at our bombing campaigns, historically, they have not been very effective at, at through the infliction of pain, changing the other state's calculus. Um, and I, I've actually been shocked, even with that low standard, I've been shocked at how ineffective sanctions have been with the Russians. So, I mean, you have a truly unprecedented global sanctions effort against Russia. I mean, you're unlikely to ever see such a, a strong grouping of economies putting sanctions on a major country like this. And it has not had any visible effect on the Kremlin's decision making. I mean, they continue to, you know, conduct their aggressive war in Ukraine. And even more, it's it's not working to m meaningfully degrade their military production. Russian military production has gone up much more than people thought uh, often. Be and that's often because the Russians are circumventing sanctions. Why? Because people do that in wars. I mean, that people smuggle. I mean, in the American Revolution, people were trading with the British and the Canadians and whatever, right? But here, if you go and you look at the semiconductor uh, consumption or, or purchases in like Armenia and Kazakhstan, they've dramatically increased since February 2022. Huh, uh, I wonder where those are going, you know? The Emirates, for instance, are supposedly our closest friend in the Arab world, or one of them. The Emirates was, the Wall Street Journal reported a couple months ago, 
It was buying oil. I mean, this is an oil state, buying oil from the Russians at a discount, selling it, putting it to its own people and selling at a higher price to the Europeans. So <clears throat> economic measures against China, I don't think are very effective. Look at the Huawei phone. I mean, we, we're, we're doing this narrow, small yard, high fence thing. And even in that, it looks like Huawei may have stolen a march on us. I don't know exactly how good the phone is, but it's selling in China. So like, I'm not even sure how effective those sanctions are, but they're definitely not effective in changing, changing China's strategic calculus. And if China decides to go to war over Taiwan, there ain't nothing that we're going to do, no matter what Kirk Campbell says, <clears throat> we're not going to like intimidate them into backing down. Are you kidding? A, because I don't think it would work. And I mean, even America, I mean, Larry Fink would call up the White House and say, you can't do that. You know, let alone, I do, we think the Germans are going to be on really like, an, I mean, there's going to be a lot of, surface stuff but i mean we see it with these like greek tankers right the russians are basically using some set of tankers that are not covered by sanctions and it's not like a technical failure with sanctions it's because the as you try to push out sanctions enforcement you start to alienate people from the coalition and of course in a war with china we're going to need all the help we can get so what are we going to say hey saudi arabia we're going to start torpedoing your tankers that are going to pakistan something or Myanmar, you know, it's going to be real tough. And I mean, now the, the Chinese have the Russians totally in their pocket for, you know, providing them with oil and gas and other natural resources. So what that means to me is there's way too much focus. It sounds like it should be, it, the, what I'm saying sounds like um, old fashioned and kind of like passe or, you know, we're different now. But I, I just honestly, I like economics. I mean, we've had an embargo on Cuba for like a million years. And what effect has it had on Cuba? And this is a tiny island that was really isolated for decades. And they we haven't even gotten them to give up. It just doesn't work very well. So the, the bad news is that we don't we're not going to be able to use our economic instrument. The good news is if we can get the military piece right, everything else we can kind of sort out. And that paradoxically, what that means for me is I tend to be more dovish on economic measures because I think it works in both directions. If people want to keep trading with China, look, you take your own risk. But if, you know, like we can still make money off each other because it's not going to fundamentally change our decision whether or not, say, to defend Taiwan or not. You know, if Larry Fink wants to put a bunch of money in there at the end of the day and we have the military readiness and he calls up and says, you know, I would tell him to go take a hike, you know, if it were up to me. But if we're thinking that we're going to wage unrestricted economic warfare as a way of doing that, I don't think that's going to, that, that's, it's, it's not worth it for the American people and it's not going to work. Bridge, thank you very much. Uh, one last question, then I'll hand it back over to, to Roy. And the, the dialogue on the Q&A has been really, really good this evening. Here is a, a question from Phil Reynolds, and, and your answer could take an hour or more. So please uh, compress it if you can. What are possible U.S. responses to a full-scale China invasion of Taiwan? Well, look, I think there's really only one that could work, which is, um, uh, you know, very um, strong, direct, unhesitant military intervention designed to defeat the invasion. Um, anything else is going to be kind of um, symbolic, kabuki. There's an there's an expression. I don't know if you know Richard Halloran. He was a New York Times reporter in Asia for a long time, Robbie uh, Roy, but a very interesting writer. And uh, he wrote something I remember years ago about a certain, he spent some time in Japan. There's a certain um, uh, uh, sort of tradition in Kabuki theater where like a defeated knight or a samurai will uh, make like a, a great sort of show of force and blah, blah, blah. But it's basically as he backs away, it's designed to like preserve face. That's what economic sanctions would be if we don't back it up with direct military denial. That we will, you know, we will shake things and look, try to look as formidable as possible as we save face as we back away. Um, so I think that's that's really it. I, I, and if that doesn't work, we're going to have to we're going to have to. I mean, the problem is if if Taiwan falls, the situations my arguments are only going to become more pronounced. So this is the point I always make to like the Europeans and stuff is like if you think it's going to be one and done with with Taiwan, you got another thing coming because we know that we can see what the Chinese are building and human nature being what it is. I was in Washington in 2002 
I mean, people don't remember this now, but people before the Iraq invasion were talking about after Iraq, it was going to be Syria and Iran and regime change and totally transforming the whole region. So nothing succeeds like success. So if they're successful, they're going to be like, well, I guess the world's going our way. And then countries in the region are going to say, well, I better cut a deal like Manila. You know, I mean, you could see governments be overthrown or whatever. Hanoi countries cutting deal. And then the situation is going to be much worse. So that's um, that's that's pretty much. And the, and the thing is, I think we're going to have very little warning. And then when I when I talk to investors or commercial actors, I think I, you know, I stress this, that that you're just going to have very little warning. In a sense, we've already had the warning that we could have. Because if you're going to mount a, a, a cross-strait invasion, you need to achieve as much operational surprise as possible. I mean, you, you're not, they're, they're not going to have strategic surprise since we know it's a problem. But we, 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 didn't, we weren't strategically surprised at Pearl Harbor. They had gamed out that possibility. But we were operationally surprised, which is what mattered. And so if you're China, like the you know, high seas fleet of the Japanese, you're not going to give us warning. Uh, and that's going to, or at least warning that will change our behavior that I think they're already hiding in plain sight when their aircraft cross the median line, when their aircraft carrier goes the east side of Taiwan, when their roll on roll off ferries operate around Taiwan and turn off their transponders, when their forces are doing exercises, when they brought forces forward more to be in Fujian in these areas in the southeast, that's, <laughs> they're already doing a lot of the things that in past eras we would have regarded as indicators. Bridge, thank you very much. Roy, over to you. Uh, yes, I wanted to come back to the uh, point that Mike Johnson, the new Speaker of the House, made, and just ask your thoughts, because uh, what you said about China using Taiwan as sort of like a stepping stone to further conquest <clears throat> might also well apply to Putin in Russia. And what uh, Johnson said was, we can't allow Vladimir Putin to win in Ukraine because it would encourage and empower China to perhaps make a move on Taiwan. Uh, how do you, how, so there's a certain logic in what he says. How do you uh, respond to that? Well, Putin, I mean, the, the fundamental difference between Putin and <clears throat> Xi is not their moral quality or their intention, but the power that they have relative to their potential targets. So I, I've, I, you know, if Putin thought he could get away with it, he'd probably write a same essay that he wrote about Ukraine, about Poland, Eastern Poland, who knows, right? The difference is that the Russians are a much, much smaller power. Their military is having great difficulty just getting through the Ukrainians, um, let alone the Poles, the Romanians. I mean, so the notion, they're not going to, they would culminate at best, even before when we thought their military was better, we thought that they would culminate somewhere in Eastern Poland or something like that. So there's just limits to how far Putin can go. Whereas um, China, if they defeat the American military in a war centered on Taiwan in the Western Pacific, there's there's like nothing to stop them. I mean, the Japanese military is fairly capable, but small and not really ready. And the South Korean military is more focused on the North and is limited relative to China. So there, I mean, the Philippines has nothing. I mean, the, the, the China's ability to project military power in the way that we have for the last 70 years the sky's the limit. They've got the they've got the uh, shipbuilding and industrial capacity to do it. It's a matter of practice and getting experience. Which if they defeated the Americans, they'd had a fair amount. So then the sort of the, the sky's the limit. I actually think that um, you know, like the Xi Jinping's assessment. If he's a rational actor, he may be more or less rational. But deductively, if I think about it, if I were in Beijing shoes, the way I'd think about it is: Am I going to be successful? <laughs> Am I going to be successful is a product primarily of an assessment of the American's capability and willpower relative to the specific thing. So capability, there are trade-offs. We are less we are less powerful in the Pacific than we otherwise would have been if we had not given so much stuff to Ukraine and if we had not elevated our force levels in, in Europe and if we had not essentially made that the priority over the last couple of years and now even more so the case of the Middle East. So from a capability point of view, we are... It is a direct trade-off, and we are losing the more we focus on other theaters. The resolve issue is fuzzier. Most people, especially kind of establishment politicians, I don't put Johnson in that category, in, in a, and I mean that in a positive sense, you know, basically say, you know, say Vice President Pence would say, China will attack Taiwan uh, if we fail in Ukraine or if we don't do the max uh, in, in Ukraine. 
I don't think that's actually correct for for a couple of reasons. And then I, <laughs> I think there's a there's an experiment that we can you know put in our minds to to show that. I mean, basically, that's that, that that's a sort of like an idea of American political resolve, as if it's like a limitless potential thing that is mostly having to do with um, uh, some I don't know, like a vision of America's role in the world. My impression of the American people, and I mean, we're all as well qualified as I am to, to comment on this, but um, is that the American people are tired of the wars in the Middle East and now an expensive war. I mean, we've given, if the supplemental were to go through, we would have given more to Ukraine in the spirit, period of about two years than we've given to Israel in its entire existence, just to give an example, according to CRS. So people are kind of saying like, whoa, you know, and like another war. I think people are, are worn out. Which, by the way, is a big, my view would be you would husband political resolve and you would only ask the American people, especially after 20 years of pretty fruitless wars in the Middle East, you would say, I'm only going to ask you when I really have to, you know, that that would be my approach. The other thing is we can run that thought experiment because the logic of, say, like Pence or, or, or you know, former amb Ambassador Nikki Haley would be if we are successful or whatever in Ukraine, China will be deterred in Taiwan. Okay, now if Taiwan, if if the fate of Taiwan is gonna be determined in Ukraine and nobody cares more about you, about the fate of Taiwan other than Taiwan itself than, than China, certainly more than we do, they obviously care the most. Why wouldn't China be directly intervening in the war in Ukraine? Like if, if people really meant that, the logic of that would say, oh, well then China should be like, no holds barred. I mean, the Chinese are saying this is a core interest, but no, they're actually the way they're acting is the way that I would act if I were in their shoes, which is to say, oh, I'm going to deplete the Americans stockpiles, money, political resolve. I'm going to distract them. That's what I'm going to do to go, go as long as possible. And actually that's even better for me if I'm Beijing than a decisive Russian victory. Cause now I have a pliant Russian client state. <clears throat> that's essentially like a gas station for me has no alternatives and is stuck in this war that keeps bleeding the Americans. Perfect. Perfect. I mean, great. And then the Chinese don't even have to pay the cost. People say, oh, the Chinese haven't provided material weapons. It's like, well, the Chinese, they're like, they're, they're, they're the, they're like the part of the, the mafia organization that's like legitimate, you know, like obviously what's keeping the Russians going more than anything is the Chinese economy propping the Russian economy. The Russians have a huge military industry. They get some stuff from the North Koreans and the Iranians. And the Chinese aren't going to go out of their way until they want to. Same in the Middle East. Who knows what, what's going on? But the Chinese are saying, hey, you know, we're here. You know, we're, we're you know, we're, we're, uh, we're not going to pay the, you know, we're, we're not going to take one side or the other. We understand both positions. It's a very savvy diplomacy that's consistent, in my view, with if you were getting ready and they are focused they are laser focused on the main on the main confrontation, which is with us. So they don't have any delusions, uh, despite what people are, are are saying, as far as I can tell. But isn't he also talking about signaling, and that actions uh, that you know look at the eve of World War II, and you had the Munich Pact, you had Mussolini capturing uh, and conquering territories in Africa, the West and the United States doing nothing. And uh, that was a signal that, that it was open for conquest, that Europe was open for conquest. I mean, isn't that what, what Johnson is uh, is fearing and, and that a lot of other people fear? Well, I don't know what the speaker is specifically saying. I don't think he's making that kind of argument from what I can tell. But the, the logic here is I'm not saying, I'm saying what Churchill is saying, which is we should rearm and focus on the main enemy, which is Germany. Don't get, don't send all your weapons and don't send your whole force and fighting the, the, the Italians in, in Abyssinia. That's not the main fight. And don't, by the way, try not to alienate people you don't need to alienate. Rather, focus on the big guy, rearm in earnest and make sure you can get that right and don't get distracted. As Churchill said, if you get things right in the decisive theater, then you can put everything else uh, back better again. I mean, Churchill was the one who made the decisions about, say, not uh, defending Singapore as much. Why? Because they needed the aircraft to defend the home islands. So that's the lesson I think of World War II. Okay. Well, uh, listen, uh, I I told our members in our flyer that I thought you would give the most cogent possible uh, rationale for uh, for Taiwan first. And I think you've actually done that. So I thank you very much. 
uh, for coming on and, and hearing all our questions tonight. So thanks so much, everybody. And uh, have a pleasant evening. Thanks. Good evening. Time. Thanks. Thanks, Roy. Thanks, Robbie. Have a great evening, everyone. Bye-bye.